I'm so happy to have all of you here this morning to share wonderful word of God with you and to celebrate this special day, Pentecost. Talking about Pentecost, there's so much we can glimpse on from it. There are moments in our life when you become a Christian, you feel like you are not capable or not able to do anything. You feel ashamed. You feel like, you feel like uh, I'm not able. You have all the reason to give why you can do things that uh, God actually call you to do. And we're going to see that in the, the book of Acts, chapter 2, that God who call you, he knew how to equip you to get his job done. This day is so special for all of us to understand something. I don't know how you feel like it, and the work God called you to do. You don't, I don't know how you might esteem yourself or which level you might think you are. But you have to know something. It's not about you. It's not about your skill, your understanding, your intellectual. It's not about everything you think you are going to make a change. The beauty things of being Christian and, and I just call ourselves a Christian because we know we are people of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We are people who walk in the scripture because the design already there for us, how we can, we can partake of things, how we can handle things, how we can speak, how things work sometimes when we face the trouble and the tribulation. Pentecost. As the things we all need to know, the presence of Almighty in your life. Somebody who can, is, who's in you, who's going to help you to understand the call that He has in your life. Change always will happen. It happened to believers. It happened to people who open up for those change, who want to say, God, I need to be used because you called me. I'm sure you called me, so I need to be used. So we are in a place now to let people know that it's not the time to give up. It's not the time to say, I can't do it. it history has proved to all of us that uh, we have a power to do all things. But they have a process for this and what are to happen. We want to read a little bit from uh, Act chapter 2. We want to start it from verse 22. People of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene, the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders and signs through him as you well know. But God knew what will happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentile. You nail him to a cross and kill him. But God released him from the horror of death and released him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praise. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead and allow your Holy One to, see, to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriot David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. 
But he was a prophet, and he knew God has a promise with an oath that one of David's own descendants will sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah resurrection. He was saying that God will not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he's exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven and God's right hand. Hallelujah. And the Father, as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor of my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for opportunity you gave to all of us, the body of Christ especially, to use all the potential that we have so we can fulfill the Great Commission and do great things in this kingdom. So, mighty God, I thank you and I worship you. I give all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. God is good. All the time. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to I wanna read something to you right now before I start it. It's, it's just a little bit uh, illustration. A traveling evangelist always put on the and, and grand final at his revival meeting. Okay. When he was to preach at the church, he would secretly hire a small boy to sit in the ceiling rafter with a dove in his cage. When he was going to preach at the church, he would secretly hire a small boy to sit in the ceiling rafter with a dove in the cage. Okay. Toward the end of his sermon, the preacher would shout for the Holy Spirit to come down, and the boy in the rafter would dutifully release the dove. At one revival meeting, however, nothing happened when the preacher called for the Holy Spirit to descend. He again raised his arm and exclaimed, Come down, Holy Spirit! There's still no sign of the dove. The preacher then heard the anxious voice of the small boy call down from the rafter, Sir, a yellow cat just ate the Holy Spirit. Shall I throw down the, holy, uh, the ho yellow cat? Hopefully, as we make our way through this book of Acts, we can find a little healthy and a little more balanced approach to the work of the Holy Spirit now cut allows. You know, when we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, as something we all need to have a balanced life. I know we are growing up to be educated, which is good. Uh, this is the culture. You got to be educated. You have to know things. You have to put yourself uh, in the level of the culture. You have to be able to accomplish things. But when we are talking about know God, serve Jesus Christ, and be a Christian, it's another dimension of uh, living as a Christian we have to demonstrate to the world. God is calling you and me, and he always says, not telling you that you are well educated. No, he said, you are, you are my representative. You are like an ambassador. And I call you wherever you go to be the light and the salt. So we, there are so much being demanded from you and me. There are things God expects you to do. And those things have to come from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Pentecost is very important because we need that kind of uh, 
hand of God in our life in order to be truly at work in this life that we are in. God loves the world. He loves everyone. But it's not everyone who are committed to him, to the call. It's not everyone who wants to receive that love. It's not everyone who has been prepared to do it. But you and I, we have a privilege to be there. And we understand how powerful it is, how awesome it is to be a Christian. So now, what do you do with? You might be saying, oh, I'm afraid. Yes, Peter have a life who was really a guy who just wanted to do everything from his own standpoint because he guy who speak, he, he jumped on the things that he wanted to fix it. He, he just threw himself on everything. God is a person who loved the world so much and he prepared all of us. He told to his disciples to wait. Because he trained them, they knew that they can do things, but there are moments we are called to wait for the power from on high. So the point, the first point we, we want to talk about this morning is about the servant was empowered. The servant was empowered. You know, Peter, like I'm saying, he's a, a guy who self-confidence, depending more on himself than on the, the Lord. You can see his action. He, he was the chosen person, the vessel to preach the Pentecost sermon. You know, you might be thinking that no, I'm a kind of guy, I couldn't do this kind of things because I know myself. It happened to everybody. It's in the Bible. Everybody has experienced that. God's message needed to be properly equipped. God knows that when you speak under his authority, under his word, it's always change is going to take place. He uses you when you yield to him. He can use everything within yourself when you yield yourself to um, the power man and the power of God. God wants to use everybody. Have you have desire to be used? That's the point. The man God uses is the man God makes. You can make yourself the way you want to. But if you want to be used, it has to come from the Lord. It has to come from God. At the Lord's Supper, Jesus predicted Peter denied. He said to Peter, tonight, all of you will desert me. And Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never deserts you. I mean, he is just as a guy who, from his standpoint, he thinks that he can do it. It's not that he's playing a game. He just tells from human being, human reaction, you know, they say, Jesus, I've been with you, but I won't, you know, I won't deserve you. And Jesus said, I tell you, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crowd, you will deny three times that you even know me. Just wait, wait the conversation that is going on here. Peter was not the enemy of God. It's not that he said, I don't like this guy. He's following God. He's actually... Christian, he's a disciple, he's doing whatever he can, but you can evaluate exactly what is going to hear. Peter is in a position where he doesn't even know that he gets himself 
and the place where he can deny Jesus Christ. Sometimes we need help in our walk with the Lord. Peter insists, even if I have to die with you, <laughs> I will never deny you. But those is the way we, we act every single day. We are in the same boat with Peter. But Peter had to experience a change. He had to experience something that we all need to experience. The empowerment, the power of God. It was that change which empowered him for the, the, the holy task. Uh, 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 something that allowed him to stand in the front of people, not be afraid, to go through the garden of the Holy Spirit just to speak the word, demonstrate it, biblically what God is saying to his people. The Pentecost preaching was an exhibition, a necessary spiritual qualification for bearing witness to Jesus Christ. Yesterday, we have a meeting with a pastor meeting in our home. We talk a lot. But I was so happy that uh, what I heard from them it strengthened me. And I feel like I was not being a man of prayer anymore. God talked about iron, sharp iron. My meeting with the people I met yesterday, the men of God, honestly, I look at like myself like I'm not being fasting enough and I'm not being praying enough. This is the work of Holy... Because we have to look ourselves in the mirror sometimes to be honest who we are as a Christian and how we are serving Jesus Christ honestly. Whatever you are hungry for, that's where your heart is. That's where God will meet you. If you're not hungry for the things of God and you stay in the side, we are talking about Pentecost, Holy Spirit moving, change you, put you in a position where you can have authority over anything that stands against you. That's the power is available even right now. Are you in a position to say, I am willing to receive it. Because the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to equip the church. It's to equip believers. Every one of us need the power of the Holy Spirit. God help us so we can do his work. Help us so we can go further. When everybody stop, we say with, with God we can go further to do great things for the kingdom of God. Jesus, God himself, he promised. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. This is the promise of God. Month of the Lord believers, God is saying, you will receive power when his Spirit come upon you. Luke 24 said this, said this, stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit come and fill you with a power from heaven. I want to use this uh, Luke scripture just to make a point here. God always promised Holy Spirit to you and me. But it's not anything, if I explain how you are, your if you hunger for something, you, hung, you want God to use you for something, it's not just quick things. It, it, God has to see your heart if you really mean what you say. But scripture is saying that uh, stay here in the city. You know, it's a matter of waiting upon the Lord. 
When we talk about waiting, we can say a lot of things. We have to wait. If you are hungry for something, you wait. How you wait? You don't just wait, not do anything. You wait by reading the scripture. You wait by praying. You wait by fasting. You wait by knocking the door. You wait by asking God to move and all up. And you wait. God said, wait so you will receive it. That's why when you go to church or you pray one time, you ask for something, you don't receive it, you don't give up. Because there are periods of waiting. They have waiting moment for all of us in order to receive what you are looking for. If it's easy, everybody will have it earlier. You have not got it right now because you have not spent time of waiting for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. But we, we, have, to, we have to understand that. This is a critical Waiting is very important for you to get in the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Effective ministry, effective work in the kingdom of God, effective influence in this life we are living, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. So waiting is very important. You know, some people who don't want to wait, we can be doing ministry, we call that mechanical person. He just keeps doing it. Yeah, we do the ministry. Hey, you are doing it. But we, what we want to do is uh, we want to be practical. But when you are practical, you are under the power of the Holy Spirit. So you see mechanical work and the practical work. And my prayer is God to help us to be a, a, a people who do things out of love. Because a practical work is making you doing it because you love doing what you are doing. Mechanical work is based most of the time in feeling, oh, I don't feel like doing it today. Oh, no, I, when I feel good, then I will do it. When I don't feel good, then I don't do it. So we have to be uh, 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 able to use all the, 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 uh, the, the, all the power, all the principles that God put there for us so we can use them all for his glory. You might be sitting there and say, oh, maybe it's not me. Oh, I want to tell you, you are, you are the person. God wants to use you because... The field is unlimited. The work is so huge. He said, go into the world and preach the good news to everyone. Mark 16. You are called to go into the world. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. So the field is big. And like I said to our, our ministry here, we, we do everything we do have to be intentional. We use everything we do to minister to people, to let people see Jesus Christ in our work. And I know many of you have been doing that already. But what I'm saying here is just to encourage you. We all have the great commission. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, it cannot be done. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot be efficient to preach your gospel. It's a, such a tremendous task could never be accomplished without the special endowment from heaven. My prayer for all of you, because I know all of you, I know you guys already. You are in the ministry already. But my prayer is God to empower you. God just to make you, transform you, put you in the place where you can say, God is doing it. It's not about me anymore. Your practical sense of doing work, it can be really secure, bring joy to you because God is involved in it. The scripture was expounded. This is the second point. 
the Pentecostal sermon was authoritative because it was scriptural correct. God's word is not man's word. When it comes out of you in the way that you are declaring the power of God through the scripture, it always takes place. And we challenge somebody and someone who listens to the word of God that carry the spirit of God and we challenge that person. Peter addressed the people who's trying to tell, oh, you guys it seem like you're drunk, and all these things. So he addressing people. He's, and with a, with a, he started with a prophetic scripture right here from Acts 2, 16 and to, uh, to 17. He said, no, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, upon all people. Your daughter, your son and daughter will prophesy. Your young men will see vision and your old men will dream, dream. You see, in Pentecost, 50 days after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in the world today. God's presence is here. Sometimes you have to discover for yourself, then it makes sense. Nobody can do for you. Because when you are Christian, you are Christian for yourself first. Because you have count to, to give to the Lord Jesus Christ. The day will come. You won't stay with your husband, your family member, or somebody. You're going to stay by, by yourself in the front of Jesus Christ. And you're going to give account. That Christianity is, after all, you first. Can you say me first? Can you say that again? Me first. You, 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 you have to be first. You have to develop that kind of relationship personal with your Lord. And then, through that relationship, he's going to speak to you. He's going to challenge you where you are. He's going to tell you exactly what I want from you and what I don't want. That's why he's going to prune you and make you beautiful flower. God is in the business of using his children. The third point, Savior was exalted. Hallelujah. Peter appeared first to the work of Jesus. Act 2.22, he said, Paul, people of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. Hallelujah. If you have Jesus in your life, I say, I'm talking to you for those who are here, for those who are watching. You are in a better place. But that's not the end of the stories. God is a God of honor. Is a God who loves his children to bring fruit. Is a God who wants all of us to always be fruitful in our life. Another word, if you are Christian, ask yourself, what am I doing? I might be fruitful, I might be productive, I might be at the place where I'm supposed to be. Because the joy for the Lord is to see you be productive. Those spirits God gave to us, those ability that God gave to us is to be productive. It's not to have it and just joke about it and talk about it. It's God to put you in the place where his glory be known by the whole world. Where are you in your service with the Lord? The spirit of truth is our confidence. John 16, 13, he said, he will guide you into all truth. When did that spirit come? I know we all sometimes have a confusion in our life. The Bible says, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak 
on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring you and me glory by telling you whatever he received from me. This is Jesus speaking. What he's saying to you and me is, when we have a Holy Spirit in us, when you don't understand anything that you are going through, if you have a problem in your life, the first person to talk to is God through his spirit that is inside of you. Talk to him so clearly. Those kind of talk we call prayer. Just be on your knees and ask, talk normal person talk and react for normal person can react and ask God. Sometimes you can cry if you have to cry. Because at that moment, it's just you and God, nobody else. You have to know him personally. So the Holy Spirit is doing all this. So he come, he gave his life. The Bible demonstrates how he paid for sin. He did all this just for we can be fruitful. Hallelujah. God was offering the sacrifice for sin. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief because you and, and I for our sin. The Father made Christ so an offering for sin. We are saved by the volunteer, vicarious death of the eternal Son of God who knew that he was coming to die in our place. I'm praying that this get to your soul because it's just, it will transform you. You get it, it will transform you. Because it's not the word of man, it's the word of God. The word of God is always transform you. It, it brings conviction, it brings things that will, will get you to the place where you start talking to Almighty God in your closet, in your room, and wherever you are. Because you want that, and you want God to do amazing work in our life. The apostle insists upon the necessity of Christ's resurrection from death and the grave. Hmm. No doubt, Peter's argument for the resurrection was overwhelming because Peter, he preached one of the, the, the sermons that get people attention. It's not because he's, a, he, he's so skillful and intelligent, but because they are power of the preaching of the gospel. He went to quote David from the psalm. For you will not leave my soul among the dead and allow your Holy Spirit to write in the grave. Hallelujah. You know that but David could not have spoken of his own self for it was now evident that David has died and has been buried and he said he said his sealed doom was at hand. So another word, David for the prophecy, exalting God. He said, so all these things we are saying is being, is, is being spoken by the prophets in the Old Testament. The realization of this is a pre-arrangement that is happening right now, and you and I, we are celebrating. Just to tell you how deep uh, and why the, the love of God is for our life. The love has been demonstrating for so long and is walking today. And you and I, even when the Old Testament is, is testifying, these things of uh, Pentecost happen today because it has been proclaimed before. Peter was uh, preaching Christ throughout his sermon. And the central fact to which the most Space is given is his resurrection. He died, he rose, his ascension, and he sent the Holy Spirit. Powerful things. The fourth point is life was transformed. What we are talking about is a transformation of life. Your life 
my life will be transformed because of the power of the Holy Spirit. First of all, we need to be convicted. Verse 37, Act 2, Peter word, the Bible say, pierce the heart. And the only thing that come up from their mouth is, brothers, what should we do? That is the power of conviction. The congregation may possess intellect and intelligence above normal, and yet the indifference of the sin and their wrong relationship to God. This is why I'm, saying, I'm, I'm telling you guys earlier, get educated is a good thing. Have God walk it through you is another thing. We all need God in our life. That's the only way we can do impossible things in this life. The preaching with conviction is the need of the hours. Before you and I preach conviction, sermon of conviction, we have to be in the place where we are really have that power to deliver that kind of message. Because that message is going to transform somebody's life. That message can change somebody. The conviction always comes from God, Holy Spirit. Whatever real conviction result is the work of the Holy Spirit. When our Lord promised the Holy Spirit, he said, when he is come, he will reprove and will convict the world of sin. The work of the Holy Spirit. He will reprove the work of sin. And he's asking all of us to be able to receive this Spirit. He's so kind. He's so loving. He, he's not going to condemn you. He's just going to convict you so you can make everything right. Because we don't have so much time in this life. Apostle Paul gave also uh, the witness of the glorious truth with, uh, with uh, his church. My speech and my preaching were not with uh, enticing word of man, wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. You know, it's great. I, I love all the training things, but we need God, man. I'm telling you, we need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you need the Holy Spirit to make a real difference in people's life. You know, we need the Holy Spirit when we preach. We need the Holy Spirit everywhere in the house. We need the Holy Spirit uh, just to talk. Talk nicely, respect people, but his power will bring people to conviction. That's where the change starts happening. When the convi a conviction happens, what's the next? Conversion. People be transformed for it. Well, I have an illustration I'm going to read to you here too. A robber comes into the bank and tells the teller to give him all the money. As he pulled out his gun to show the teller, the teller responds, but I don't believe in guns. I have never seen a gun hurt anybody, and I don't believe that you can hurt me. What will happen if the robber decided to show the teller that his gun actually works? Will the terror disbelieve keep him from hurt when the robber pulls the trigger? The Bible is the sword of the spirit. And it is going to work in people's hearts whether or not they believe in just use the word. I just want to make a little bit of difference there for you to see. The word of God is God himself. It's the word that penetrates the heart and change and challenge and put you in a position where you will say, oh God, I need you and I need your help. So the conviction happened by the Holy Spirit through the disciple. One of the disciples brought from 
the place where they feel like they can do it in their own strength, then the Holy Spirit take over. Brother, what shall we do? This is the question. When those questions happen, this is, you know, it's an opportunity to lead somebody to Jesus. I don't know about you, this kind of a question is a coming different way. Some people come to you, they don't say, what shall I do? But they ask you a question like, uh, how can I read the Bible? In other words, they, they have a desire to have something transforming their life. When somebody says, I want to start reading the Bible because he had assessed his own life and he feel like uh, he has to start taking steps. He has to start taking the step that will help him. What shall we do? For men do not ask a question about eternal issue when there is no conviction. When there are conviction, is always something. How did uh, Peter respond? One word he used, repent. Repent. <laughs> Hallelujah. Repentance means literally a change of mind. You know, this Jew had the wrong conception regarding Jesus Christ. They always have, a, their weak hand has taken and crucified Jesus Christ because they don't know better. And, and, and Paul has go to them. Jesus go to them, they will not receive him as Lord because they don't have any knowledge about Jesus Christ that he come for them. So now Peter have to say, change your attitude, change your mind about Jesus Christ. So true repentance affects not only a change of mind and attitude, but a complete moral reformation which is sin and sorrow by sin and a deep regret. This is totally your life. When we say somebody to repent or to change his behavior, his life, it's just see everything about yourself because you're not doing that just for today. Something you want to keep doing it. So it demands you to just search your heart. Look yourself clearly and ask God for forgiveness. And wanting to change, it won't be quick. That's why the Bible says, you need to wait. There are moments you need to wait. Another word, go back asking again. Keep asking until you receive it. And the process of asking, Holy Spirit is going to start working in you. Convict you on a lot of things you have to learn to deal with. That's the work he, he does. He always loves you. He just wants you to put you in a position so he can empower you so you can go and do what he called you to do. In Thessalonians, when Paul is talking to them, he said, turn to God from idol to serve the living and the true God. The word has been preached. Repentance is there. Are you ready to repent of your sin? I know the world has their own way of dealing things, but we are called a special people to make the difference in the world. Are you ready to do that? The Pentecost sermon was outstanding. He preached, the Bible said, 3,000 souls were saved in one day. <laughs> 3,000 people who just preach the world the way it is, is not trying to change things, the scripture to please people. They just share the world. And the Bible said 3,000 gave their life. I know that word, conviction was immediately followed by conversion. If you are convicted and you know what they tell you is the truth by the Holy Spirit, you will looking for the way to be converted. This is our, our timing now. God is expecting you and me not to forsake the power that has been already ready for you. But he wants you to use all those provisions he has for you so you can be able to do your work. God 
has not changed. He sees the same God. But if you want to really be effective in our life, we need change. I know that word, we need God, the Holy Spirit, in our life. We are doing a lot of things in our church. To tell you the truth, I'm not satisfied yet because there's so much we can do. So much. And I'm praying for the power of the Holy Ghost to come upon each one. Everybody in the month of the Lord to receive the anointing, the Pentecost anointing of the Lord for his glory, because that anointing is for mission, for the purpose of reach out to other people, to tell people with love how they need to know Jesus Christ, to let people know that they can do it. We can do it together. People are dying every single day. People don't know better. The only place of education people are getting in the world, if it was on TV, then the world won't educate them. But you and I, we are here to bring the good news to this world around us. Are you ready to receive the power of the Holy Spirit for your life? The purpose, I said earlier, is to equip the body of Christ. If you're not equipped, we don't want to be mechanical, but we want to be practical. Everybody can do anything. But when you are practical in your work, you enjoy it because you know God is moving. I pray for those who are watching, those who are here, to ask God, if you have not received yet, to wait for him because he can do it. Most of that, it depends on us because we are, have a problem to wait. God to help the month of the Lord to help each believers so we can be in a position of waiting and receive a transformation that God intends for all of us to have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? amen. amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. God, we just pray, Lord God, that this day of Pentecost now will be just a word. God, I pray that you use truly your power to transform us. Your presence to equip us, to bring us to the next level of our work with you. Because we know for sure a lot of people out there need what we have. And the only way those people can be, know about you is for us to go out to minister to them. So God bless the month of the Lord Church. Bless the church in this area and help all of us to focus on the Great Commission. We give all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to give opportunity for anyone who have not received the Lord Jesus Christ. Just pray after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. This morning I confess you that you are my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me for all my sin. God, I need your Holy Spirit today. So my life won't be the same. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone who pray this prayer. I pray for the power, your transforming power. They always start working in those people's life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.